My name is Andre Minchikov. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the UCA, and I welcome Professor James Victor from the University of Hong Kong, who came to our conference on post imperial constellations, society, identity, environment. And uh, we would like to you know, learn more about you and about your talk and your interest in uh, post imperial situations generally and how it can be related to the Central Asian context, because we try to have a public perspective here at the University. It's one of the important points of the university research agenda. So I will start with a question uh, asking you to tell us more about yourself, your previous background and your current research interest. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andre, for um, having me to the conference. It's been lovely to be here. Um, so about myself, uh, I'm a trained as a historian. Uh, I trained in the United States. Uh, and when I was training in the United States, uh, I was very interested in American history. Um, it's very common for people when they grow up in a country, especially a country that talks a lot about itself, like the United States or Russia or China or France or Japan, uh, to be interested in this sort of internal self-history. And uh, so I just sort of almost naturally gravitated toward U.S. history and an early undergraduate that was interesting and uh, I was attracted to my postgraduate career as well. Um, but when I did my PhD, it wasn't it was in early America, or colonial America, as it's often claimed, which refers to the British settlement of North America before U.S. independence. And that field has changed a lot in the last couple decades. It used to originally be the history of the nation that will soon come to be, the prehistory, the preamble to the USA. But, of course, it's evolved, and now we look at the history of these places many of which did not become the United States, but became Canada or became other polities like the Bahamas and Bermuda, or the Caribbean islands like Jamaica. And uh, therefore, as I engage in this field as a doctoral student, I became so much more interested in understanding this era as this early modern history of empire, rather than, of the British Empire, rather than as the history of the future United States. And so I began to migrate toward the British Empire, and I became especially interested in the boundaries and edges of empire, the ways that uh, it can be hard sometimes to see across it. Uh, if British historians do the British Empire, they don't see that empire's relationship with other empires necessarily as brightly as they might need to. And so that became an area of interest for me going forward. And uh, I know that you have a book about the comparative studies of empire. So mm -hmm. it's not just the British Empire and the American pre-imperial history uh, or imperial history before independence, but you actually do the research on uh, comparing different empires. Yes, um, you know, it, this is true. I have uh, one project I'm working on uh, for a future book. It's not, uh, it's not written yet. Uh, it's going to be called uh, Suez Passage to India, and it is about uh, the way the Suez Canal, the idea of the Suez Canal and the later physical enactment of it on the ground uh, really uh, forced the British and French empires to work together because they both needed to use the canal to access their colonies in Asia. Um, and yet they never ceased to be antagonistic or semi-antagonistic at the same time. And so they had this sort of Enemy, this frenemy relationship in which they uh, uh, cooperated and often conflicted at the same time. And sometimes the same act could both support, could support both cooperative and antagonistic roles. Um, and so I've sort of used this as a lens to reinterpret uh, British and French imperial relations in Asia. So we somehow tend to think usually now, that imperial in, empires and imperial cap powers were detrimental to the, to the development of the global economy. And even, even the Marxist theories, which were primarily anti-colonial and anti-imperialist, they recognized the significance of empires for shaping the global world today. And when we compare different empires, can you pinpoint or highlight some of the important elements to which these empires contributed and where we can see any difference, how different empires helped or contributed to the global development? Mm. That's an interesting question. I think um, one of the uh, one of the issues with one of the problems with thinking about empires as a 
causing damage in global development. And um, there are strong arguments for the different kinds of damage that empires have caused. Uh, it, one of the problems with that line of thinking is, is that it, it, it risks a potential counterfactual of some sort of fantasy non-imperial arrangement where that damage would not have occurred. But actually, the most likely counterfactual is usually a different empire that would have just done damage in a different way. Um, and so inevitably, because empire is the normal frame of human relations throughout most of the world till at least 1900 and in many parts until today, therefore, it is the only way that anything, that any development or non-development or hindrance can occur. Uh, and so I think it's sort of a little, it's not necessarily unhelpful to sort of get stuck on that. Um, yeah. So we again normally think about empires as a kind of unified actor. Yeah. But you are going to talk in your talk about a company, a private company. So how can we understand better um, different tensions, different actors within empires themselves, which acted upon the world? And what was the role of these private companies, basically private companies, which were the uh, channels for colonialism or imperialism? That's a great question. You know, politics always happens. Um, and one place politics always happens is within organizations. So in any organization, there'll be a hierarchical structure and there'll be politics about that. Um, and there'll also be politics just between organizations. And so as a result, in the British Empire, in the Dutch Empire, which I'll be talking about tomorrow, um, in the French Empire, there's different institutions and elements at work that have their own goals and objectives. Um, one classic example from the 20th century that's commonly cited um, is Japan and its empire. Um, there was a long-standing potential conflict between its army and navy, between what its army wanted to achieve on land and what it, in Asia uh, against Russia and China, and what its navy wanted to achieve at sea against the United States and Britain and other powers. And, there was a zero-sum trade-off. Every yen uh, spent on a ship was not a yen spent on a soldier. And so there is inevitably an internal uh, dynamic at work. You asked about uh, companies. And so you know, in this case, and now with uh, organizations like the, the private military organizations like the Wagner Group being much more in the news recently, it's not so unfamiliar. The idea of or uh, American organizations like Blackwater or yeah. that, the outsourcing of military action to private or semi-private third parties that support the broader imperial interest was quite common in the early modern period. Um, the English East India Company was founded in 1600, the Dutch one in 1602, at a time when neither the English or Dutch states had the kind of effective competence as a state to be able to function globally in that way. They didn't have a bureaucracy at that scale. They didn't have the state capacity to inter to affect, govern, and have that much control within England or the Netherlands, let alone a half a world away. So they created a separate organization to do that, that raised its own money, that would help fund the British state through its profits, that had its own private army and its own private navy, and would engage in its own private wars overseas against Asian powers, against rival Europeans. Um, and this was a useful way to outsource um, war that was beyond the institutional capacity of the state. So now I can ask you about your talk tomorrow. Mm. Can you summarize it uh, in a few paragraphs, I would say? Sure. So uh, tomorrow I'm talking about this weird period in Dutch colonial history in what is now Indonesia. Um, it, the Dutch conquered all of Indonesia, but it, it took a very long time to do so. And the, so we can really just divide this imperial history into two blocks. One is the period from when the early Dutch arrival in the 15 and 1600s until 1795, when the Dutch East India Company dies. And the next is the period from the 1830s onward, the beginning in 1830, when there's a new economic relationship between uh, the Dutch and their empire in Indonesia that really centered on Java um, and a new way of taxing the Javan people with something called the culture system where they were 
basically told uh, the tax is that you must give 20% of your crop to the Dutch colonial state as tax or 20% of your labor to pay to, to produce this crop. Um, and then these, these crops were then sold back in the Netherlands at, at profit um, by the Dutch colonial state. Um, and this system uh, uh, was a, a new trading arrangement and a new colonial system that exists from 1830 onwards. But this gap, this weird 35 year gap between 1795 and 1830 is what I'm going to talk about in my paper between this old trading system of the Dutch East India Company and the new of the sort of the culture system when they had this awkward transition um, at a time when the Dutch were no longer a global power of any real significance um, and in which to even hold on to the Dutch East Indies at all was something they struggled to do and failed to do at times. So uh, they had to rely almost entirely on foreign powers to be the merchants mm -hmm. that supplied the connection between the Netherlands and Java. So my talk will talk about how foreigners did this, but also how the Dutch tried to wrest uh, the economic benefits of empire away from these foreigners and back into Dutch hands and how that had consequences for the Dutch empire that would then come over. So if I understand correctly, the Dutch, while they were a bit weaker mm. uh, in between these two different periods of strength, they somehow had to co-opt not just the Indonesian elites, but also different the agents uh, that existed or coexisted with the Indonesians across the region yeah. to, per to sort of I don't know what better to support the imperial effort, the colonial effort. Yes, because I mean the Dutch effort, uh, um, the Dutch were in, so weakened in this middle period. And this is the period of the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars. So from 1795 onwards, the Dutch are conquered by the French. They can't send out any troops, any ships, any new administrative personnel to Java because the British Navy will stop them. So uh, the new colonial governor has to sneak out on an American ship so that no one sees them. This is not a position of strength when you have to send your personnel out this way. Um, and, and so they do this uh, and they co-opt American, Danish, Hamburg, um, British merchant ships to support their trading efforts. Um, and in this period also an act of economic transition as well. So being a private company has its uh, advantages when you can't rely on the imperial state. It does, it does. Uh, but in this case, this is one in which one private company dies, the senior company, and they have to then, they're suddenly lost with what to do because there wasn't, the senior company was a private corporation, but it was a mega corporation. It was one of the, it was one of the biggest employers in the Netherlands. And so when it collapsed, there wasn't, any other economic actor that could fill its shoes. It was a sort of quasi monopoly, uh, more, maybe more usefully thought of as a state champion, just you know, so thoroughly filled its niche. So you were educated in the uh, United States. That's right. And you are now teaching Hong Kong. This is true. And you teach uh, European studies. You mm -hmm. teach a course on uh, empire, European empires, primarily, mm -hmm. and on European history. Mm -hmm. So when we operate uh, in uh, that part of the world where we have to talk about Europe, European empires and European imperial legacies. How, how can we approach it? How can we teach things uh, which would, to some extent, to use the phrase provincialize Europe and European history and sort of put it to the context of local histories, national histories, and the agenda of the people whom we are actually educating in the countries which of what's the difference? That's a great question. It, it is um, a challenge because so much of the literature that's available for students to read that's assigned, they kind of get assigned in English, is written assuming an American audience fundamentally, secondarily a British one, um, the rarest occasion in Australia. Or at least European. And, and, or at least European. Um, and so there isn't a, uh, there isn't a presupposed presupposition that the reader is from India or from Kyrgyzstan or from Hong Kong or from Namibia. And so that makes it, um, the assumptions that are baked in are very different about what is normal and right? that's what you're getting to. Um, and, and so I find that to be quite striking. I teach several, I teach a course in the First World War. I teach two courses on the Atlantic world and empires of the Atlantic world. And um, I find it, uh, 
I find one part, one element that's somewhat liberating is that because in the Atlantic World courses I teach, because this Atlantic concept is usually new to my students to begin with, I'm not burdened with, it's liberating, because I'm not burdened with the pre-existing uh, conceptions that I need to work around. Whereas if I were teaching this, if I were teaching history, or in the United States, teaching American history to an American student, my fundamental problem would be teaching, would be trying to get them to see beyond their nationalist blinders. Whereas, and they would have little framework to get around it because they're Americans and being listening in American English at American University to an American professor. But because I am in a third party space, um, it's I find it much more straightforward to simply teach about this as explaining a foreign place and why, how they do the way they do. Um, the way that one did when I was an undergraduate, teach courses on the history of Japan. Uh, so now I switched the shoes on the other foot in terms of who's different. Okay, it was a pleasure talking to you and uh, the great answers, and I hope we will have your presentation tomorrow.